Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I'm your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries and librarians. The show is broadcast live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. You can always um, go to our archives and watch the recording afterwards at your convenience. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch, so um, please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think may be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. Uh, we do quite a mixture of things here on Encompass Live. For those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries in Nebraska, and that is for all types of libraries. So you will find things on our show that are for publics, academics, K-12, corrections, museums, archives, um, it's all across the board. <laughs> so, um, you'll find anything on there. Um, we do a mixture of types of things, book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, demos of services and products that we think may be of interest to you. Uh, we do bring in guest speakers from outside of Nebraska, outside of the Library Commission to present on um, interesting things that libraries are doing, uh, things that we think they could be doing. Um, we also have Nebraska Library Commission staff come in and do things that are more specific to um, our um, and available to our Nebraska libraries. But today, um, before we get started with today's show, uh, that topic for today, I'm just going to um, briefly show, um, talk about what we're doing here at the Nebraska Library Commission for our libraries in Nebraska related to the COVID-19 pandemic that um, we are all dealing with right now. And you can see here, this is our commission website, um, and we have a, a post here right at the top of our blog. It's, always, it's pinned up there, so it's always at the top of the blog about resources that we have. We have a link to when we do, we are trying to keep track of libraries, public libraries in the state that are opened and closed and reopening and what they're doing and accommodations they're making. So there's a list there if that is something you want to check up on uh, a library that you know of or your library to make sure you have the right info. If you are a Nebraska library, this is specifically just Nebraska libraries. For the resources that we have here, we have on our blog post, we're talking about what we are collecting. We have a form for libraries to fill out to keep that list updated for us. Um, and then we have a subpage here with information depending on your situation, your business, your own unemployment. Uh, what can I do with my kids at home? Uh, but specifically for libraries, I just want to highlight this for our libraries um, here in Nebraska. We have a lot of information on here and I, that you may need that may be helpful to you. We are paying attention to what's going on, what resources have been put out by um, our state, by ALA, IMLS, um, the CDC, anything um, up to date. Uh, if there have been webinars or, or uh, sessions done in the recordings or things are coming up, we put on here um, some guidance um, about how to close, how to reopen your library, some information that's being um, collected. So it's always being updated in here. Summer reading, that's a big thing coming up that um, people are trying to, um, how are we going to hold summer readings? We've got information on there. So we're always updating this page for our libraries. So if you are a Nebraska library, keep an eye on this page, see what new information we may be adding to it on a regular basis um, to help you as you're um, dealing with your situation in your communities. Um, if you're not a Nebraska library, check out and see if your state library or your state library association may be doing the same um, similar things for you. I just want to make sure that our libraries knew that this was available to them and to keep an eye on it. So we're going to switch over now into our uh, here we go, presentation for today. All right, Amanda, you should have present uh, the pop-up to present. There we go. You can do that full screen there for you now. And we're shifting the controls so I can access the present button. <laughs> there it is. All right, so on today's Encompass Live, um, it is the last Wednesday of the month. And here what we do on Encompass Live um, on the last Wednesday of the month is our Pretty Sweet Tech session. Uh, Amanda Sweep is with us. Good morning, Amanda. From home. 
And she is our technology innovation librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission. And once a month, usually the last Wednesday of the month, as long as we can keep that schedule, um, she does a session um, that is specifically something techie. So if you are a tech type person, this is the session for you. We may have other things throughout the month that are also leaning to that tech side. But if you definitely want to keep up on things and going that way, this is the one to keep to attention to. Pretty sweet tech is her um, the name of her sessions every week every month and today she's going to tell us something that is i think very very important how to make digital literacy less boring yeah. now we might not think it's boring i don't know but <laughs> there obviously are some people out there who are talking at them about it maybe not don't agree with us so much so um we'll get some tips and tricks from amanda about that so i'll just hand it over to you amanda to tell us all how to how to do that so a while back, I did a few outreach sessions to libraries across the state, pretty much. I gathered different library directors and library staff members to get an idea of how digital literacy is going. Mm -hmm. And in one of these sessions, one of the library directors just asked me, how can I make people care? And it was just, it was a good question. And so first of all, getting teenagers to care about anything is a feat in and of itself. And, but they can also have fun with it. So it's kind of like looking at it in a way that not why digital literacy should, how you should care about digital literacy, but what matters to you and what are the digital tools that can help you accomplish your goals. So in the chat function, if you could tell me, who do you work with in your, in your library? And these are some kind of common sample groups that libraries tend to bucket people out into, teenagers, children, adults, and older adults. So I want to get a feel for who you're working with so I can kind of give a little more attention to areas in case there's more people on the call working with one group over another. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, so go ahead and type into your questions section if you go to our webinar inter interface and let us know who you mostly uh, work with. And so be, mostly work with or who you mostly work with with digital literacy. Yeah. Uh, adults, adults, ah, uh, someone works with staff, so other library staff. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. Adults and seniors, college students, nurses, faculty, physicians. Uh, staff and adults, a lot of adults, one older adults, teens and tweens, there's one for teens, community college, so we work with everyone, mostly adults, K-12 school, but mostly K through fifth grade, cool, staff and adults. I think older adults, I like that, good, they, they And other teens. So it's quite a mishmash, mainly adults or older adults, but you still got a few teens, tweens coming in. All right. Yeah. I can work with that. <laughs> <laughs> so technology is a tool that's designed to actually help us do something. It's not the central part of our lives, but it just helps us get the job done. So if we want to encourage people to find digital literacy school skills that they need and libraries want to market digital literacy skills that they need. I found out that it really helps to find out what stage of life all these people are in. What are they interested in? What problems are they facing on a day-to-day -day basis? And so I found I collected some of the most common reasons that people go to the library or seek out digital skills. And this is more or less what I found is that people are just trying to figure out life and they want to figure out adults are trying to figure out parenting. Kids are trying to figure out how to form an identity and they're trying to kids and teens are trying to figure out how to do well in school and try to figure out who they want to be when they grow up. And adults want to figure out what they want to do in the world and how they want to shape the world for the better. 
Mm-hmm. Someone and actually commented after we had finished kind of gathering the comments about who they serve that some that relates to this actually says that they serve rural adults who need GED or other educational help. Oh, perfect. That would be like related to navigating life <laughs> and job yeah. skills. <laughs> get those skills yeah so this is kind of the funnel that I look at all digital skills because we could look at the corpus of all knowledge that exists everywhere in the world of digital literacy but then we want to narrow that down to what people actually care about and this is how we make digital literacy less boring is by tying it into things to problems that people are actually trying to solve and So all of these skills, all of these problems that people are working on right now, they tend to bucket out into these different categories. Communication, safety, security. Following the rules, I mean, we're trying to navigate social structures in the world. Each different, so right now the the World Wide Web has made us go global. And now we're interacting with different groups of people and we're interacting with people in different ways. But how do we know how to shift the way we behave so that we belong in that new social structure? And you may have seen a lot of different communication problems. And this is actually a question I'll ask now. Has anyone noticed in their community some different communication problems or some different issues that people have had trying to navigate the digital world? And this can be when they're trying to get a new job, when they're trying to interact with people on social media. What are the problems that people have have faced? And this can be community or yourself. You don't have to admit it was you. (laughs) All right, go ahead and type in the question section there. Let us know what uh, your most issues people have had. Lack of reliable internet access. That's a big yeah. one. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Working the computer. Oh, there's a couple of things that are very related. They do not know about email scams and believing everything on the internet is true. Yeah. <laughs> That's critical thinking and yeah. Uh, afraid of the technology and not wanting to learn. Just. I don't know, I don't do computers, I've heard that a lot, or I don't, uh, computers don't like me, that kind of thing. Agree, someone agrees, not being able to discern valid sources. Information literacy. Yep. Um, And as people are struggling with trying to find and apply for jobs, that's another one, that now that it's online, how do they do that? Ah, oh, this is, yeah. D- uh, difficulty unable to move back and forth between smartphone interfaces and PC interfaces, both adults and youth. Because it can be, I've had that trouble myself. It can be very difficult. I'm looking at it one way on my phone. And I can't find the thing I need or the button I need. And I say, and I've, I've learned this just my own experience. You know, if I go on my PC, I bet you I'll get a whole different view and it'll, I can find what I need, which it shouldn't be that difficult, but it does, yeah. Expect the internet to be 100% or the computer to be 100% secure. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Different devices working differently. A lot of people are saying that. Um, people think they are too old to learn how to use the computer. I don't. I hear that one a lot. It's not yeah. true, but I hear it a lot. My mom, she's 70 something and she is all over her iPad and computer now more sometimes even than me and my sister. <laughs> right? Yeah. She has learned it and has, has become her thing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and that's that's what I was waiting for. Finally, somebody said not knowing how to use a mouse. Yeah. So used to devices like your phone, your phone or uh, tablets that a lot of people have that are all touch screen and it's not a mouse that you're using. That may be something new to some people. Yep. You know, I was teaching a graphics class a little while ago and I was amazed that this, this one woman who was really interested in the class, she just wasn't picking up on it. And I eventually found out it was because she didn't know the left and right click. 
Ah. And it wasn't because she didn't know computers. It was because she was working on a PC and she was used to a Mac. Oh, see, that's a whole different yeah. thing too. Yes. So it wasn't it wasn't her fault in any way, shape, or form. It just I never even thought to ask who's used to using a PC and who's used to using a Mac. Because it's not on the checklist, but it is now. It needs to be, yeah. yeah. Um, kids are using Macs very often in school, and then they come to the library that has PCs. The yeah. Public library, and that's a totally different thing. This is a good suggestion. Jeannie says, actually, the one who mentioned not knowing how to use a mouse, I get them to do puzzles. Give them something that's fun to do online that gets them learning how do I click, what's right, what's left. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. And this is something I think is probably specific to schools and maybe um, colleges, valid resources being blocked by your IT or your security. Yeah, the filter. Mm -hmm. So this is a guidebook that I put together. And yeah. this will give you a lot of information about a lot of the problems that people have run into. So this resource, and I'll go to the privacy and security, I separate it out into the most common questions and issues that I've come across that people have had troubles with finding an answer to or finding good information about. And I gave kind of an overview of more or less why each of these different sections is important and some different resources that libraries can use to either give to patrons or to use for themselves to develop their own programming because most of this, and this is probably a good one, a good example to use here. People love a good infographic. It's something that kind of really resonates. It's short, it's to the point, mm -hmm. and you can hand it out during pretty much any activity. And so this is kind of to help you along your way in trying to get relevant information without having to do a bunch of background research yourself. And it's just a good starting point to find out what's out there. And this one is one that I've run into a lot. People trying to build their own job skills, but without having the baseline communication and etiquette skills to be able to write a good email or to be able to communicate effectively it's kind of hard to launch off into that job skill territory in, in like a digital way. And they don't, a lot of times people don't think about employers looking at their own social media or employers looking at expecting you to have a LinkedIn social media because it's just not something a lot of people think thought about before. Yeah. So, and now the thing is that when I went out for the different outreach activities and I talked to different patrons and libraries that were trying to build these skills, what I heard over and over again was that people need to know more about cybersecurity, but when libraries set up different events and different activities for people to just learn these skills, they had low attendance. And I was flabbergasted by this because it's stuff that people need to know and people have asked about it. And so I know I don't 100 percent understand why it is that a security only session doesn't get attendance. But I did find out that if we use infographics and keep a handout of resources on hand and embed cybersecurity and online security into other programs, that works more effectively. So for example, if you have a crafting group that comes in all the time and they're learning how to knit, you can do a five minute session at the end of the knitting group that says how to find yarn online and then do a little pinpoint of how to find the lock and the address bar to know that you're going to a safe site and give a handout that's a, with a recommendation for how to shop online. And it's in a relevant source and then they can apply that to other skills. And it also reaches out to multiple age groups. So we're just kind of chucking in that cybersecurity instead of making it the focal point. And that seems to have made all the difference. Connected to something that they're actually interested in. Right, yeah. So now this and all of this should be embedded into larger problems that people are trying to solve. Because a lot of times when we say, 
learn how to talk to people online, you might not get you some in some places you might get a ton of attendance. People might already be interested in that, especially in colleges or people that are specifically looking for that assistance. But a lot of times in public libraries, we found that people don't show up. Other things take priority, but just tuck it in somewhere else. So now let's look at some examples of what I found does work. And so the biggest thing is challenging your own assumptions first. So what we get a lot is people just saying that kids are wasting time on the internet and people saying that it's not a good place to go. So as a librarian or instructor or whatever your position may be, start writing down what you believe about kids using the internet. And then look at common sense media or look at the conversation, this link here, to get the kid's point of view. Because we might be saying that kids are only going on social media to waste time and look at memes, but maybe they are legitimately connecting. And then how can you bring together parents and kids in a good conversation about how they should be using the internet and how it affects them? And do kids and teens have a good safe place to give a their own opinion about how their life on the internet should be. Because we can't really tell kids that they have to do something. I think my brother actually just had like a little, um, trying to limit the amount of time that my niece spends on her tablet. Hmm. And so he tried to just take the tablet away and try to hide it away but th that didn't work so well. Yeah. So instead he wound up writing in, I sent him a link to the New York this New York Times article that a group of parents paired up with common sense media and they wrote kind of a little guidebook for how to make an agreement between parents and kids for how to use this technology. And my brother started asking so how does this tablet actually make you feel? Like, how do you feel when you go on these different apps? And how do you feel when you talk to the other kids? And we, he found like a list of apps that stressed her out and he uninstalled all of them. And then, <laughs> then he found like a list of apps that he actually, she interacted with different kids and she had a really good time and it was well regulated and it was moderated by common sense media and he knew all the different security features and he left those on there and but because he had that agree that agreement made she was okay with it she was part of the conversation so how can we encourage different parents to have that same conversation and it may just be the case of giving them that resource from the new york times or it may be if your library has a parents group, which it sounds like a lot of libraries are starting to do or they already have. So if you happen to have that in place or want to give it a shot, that might be a good group activity for parents that they can practice on each other and talk about what's worked and what's hasn't and get that going. And this is just a fun one, but digital literacy uh, the International Literacy, Literacy Association, they put together a collection of digital literacy related storybooks and they're just kind of fun. So this is kind of a good one to just keep smaller kids thinking about that. And you don't have to dig around a whole ton to find specific books because International Literacy already did it, which mm -hmm. is help. And I'll mention here while you're showing that you've got this um, link here. Um, I assume that's a link to the digital yeah. literacy page. Okay. Um, after, um, when you get the um, recording for today's show, the link to Amanda's Google Slides will be available to you as well. 
So don't worry about it if you don't see these links or don't know where all these websites are or anything. You'll have all that information afterwards. And I'll actually put this in the chat in case you want to reference things along the way. You want to grab it? You got it now? Yep. And there it is. And so it's in the chat. And so this one I'll just kind of gloss over because I already talked about giving kids a safe place to talk about it and how to build that environment. And this is just recommendations from people who have already done it and who have been practicing with it for a while. And this is kind of a good way for kids to report bullying and abuse when they don't feel comfortable talking to local adults or their own parents. And letting kids express themselves through artistic means. Libraries are awesome at that. All right. And so Google also made a resource for kids to start playing around with game, like online games that help teach cybersecurity and digital literacy. And it's called Be Internet Awesome. So these are just little, I forget which age group, but it's pretty young. So if you want to get kids started early, it's a good way to go. Um, the only thing is that you would need a halfway decent internet speed to be able to get it going because it takes a little bit of bandwidth to get the game playing. And there's also some safety tip for parents because a lot of the cybersecurity for kids' devices, it seems like parents are trying to get to figure out how to best set that up. So this is kind of a good thing to give to parents groups or maybe work with PTA or just get the word out there. And this is also a big one that I came across pretty frequently was how do we teach kids to be responsible with their money? Mm -hmm. And a really fun way that, and I actually completely forget where this actually came from because I came across it such a long time ago, <laughs> but it's letting, they're letting kids choose a game that's actually going to be used as a library service and giving them the responsibility of having to agree to a budget and choose really good online, like safe sites to go to to purchase the game, checking the reviews to make sure that it's a good one and that it'll be updated, and then actually making that game available. And that really gets them, it gives them that sense of responsibility that I did this, I picked this, and this actually matters. And then, if you have a group of teens that either want an internship or they might want to build more responsible financial habits themselves, asking the teens to write the, this is what I learned the hard way and this is what you should know for the younger kids, it also gives that sense of responsibility. So if you have any teen groups that come in or teen advisory boards, this is an option. And so more about teens, and that latte looks really good. <laughs> so again, there is a survey out that went out that says that 80% of teens impulse buy online. And if you want to check that stat, that link is clickable. But so one good project that I came across was to ask teens to list every single ad that they've ever seen online and in that moment say whether they need it and then write down why they need it and then collect that list and come back a week later and I find out if they even remember what they saw and if they need it. Sounds like something I should do, actually. I should do it too. I actually did try it. Um, I found, I went to 
12 different websites. I found 140 different ads. I didn't need most of them. Mm-hmm. I almost bought toothpaste bites that are completely, they say that they're completely eco-friendly and oh. instead of using a plastic tube, it uses a glass jar and it uses like a little powder-based tablet that you bite into and then you're supposed to chew it and it turns into a paste. And I was like, I want to be more sustainable. Beat the tube. And oh. yeah, I didn't buy it because I was writing my list. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it was kind of pathetic. But this gives them a way, gives people a way to really think about how online ads affect them. And if it's just an impulse or if they legitimately need it, I might get that toothpaste later. <laughs> and Let's you can search it more to see if it really works. Right, yeah. And another one for both adults and for teens, and actually pretty much any age group, is book groups about digital literacy. Mm-hmm. So this was a this is a really popular book. It was turned into a movie called Love Simon. Mm-hmm. And so the main premise of this book is that Simon was sending emails back and forth to a person that he was interested in, and they were starting to kind of build a relationship but one of those emails got into the wrong hands and it just turned into like this huge thing. I don't want to give too much of the plot away because you might actually want to read it. It was a good book, but you can use these books and similar ones to kind of talk about how digital tools can go haywire and how you can change your own security settings and privacy settings to prevent that from happening. And it doesn't have to be this book. There's a ton of books where digital things go wrong, but this was just an example because I just read it recently. And so this is one like a fun way to teach different communication. And this is one where you can bring in teens and different age groups because you can ask either kids or teenagers to write a story either entirely in emojis or mostly in emojis, then have them pass that story off and try to ask other people to interpret it. (laughs) (laughs) And we found out that different age groups have drastically different interpretations and different people from different parts of the world have drastically different interpretations. Because I emojis from the, the, like write a movie title or a book title of in just emojis and see if you can figure yeah. out what it is too. Yeah, that'd be fun. <laughs> yeah. But and this kind of talk this kind of gets to the point of communication and use your words, people. <laughs> and so this. We kind of touched upon this in the kid category, but in the teen category, teens tend to start to get more, I don't want to say isolated because they're not actually isolated. What they found out is a lot of parents were trying to get their kids to go offline more and to do activities with their in-person friends. And then the teens were like, but none of my friends actually have the same interests. Like, I love them as human beings. They're delightful. But I really want to explore coding or I really want to learn more about the opera. And there's just no one here that will help me do that. So they went online and they found that new community. So are we being a little bit too harsh on kids spending time and building community online? And so this link, the Listen to Teens, this goes to Common Sense Media. And this Common Sense Media, they collect, they ask, they allow parents to pose a bunch of questions. And then if we click this open, is the internet making my kids socially isolated? If we have the common sense answer that's at the top, 
but a lot of the comments are from teenagers and kids. So this is a really good way to get that perspective and just get out of your head as an adult because we might have our own biases, but if we look at the perspective from the other side, we can start asking better questions and help kids differently. And as, the, as a library or as an education resource, we can kind of encourage parents to look at resources like this and just let them know that these are out there and that this is an option because communication is a thing. Mm -hmm. And so let's go down here and back to present. So, and this is a good one for both teenagers and adults and pretty much anyone. But as people learn more about technology, digital, school, digital skills, what different software can do, what different apps can do, what different technology can do, what interests them and what would they like to explore more? And then how would they get the opportunity if so in this previous slide, we were talking about how parents wanted their kids to spend more time with real people in person and to have that face-to-face -face interaction. But kids wanted to explore the opera encoding and they only have that opportunity online. So if you want kids to start spending more time in person and face-to-face, -face, how do you develop those opportunities closer to home? And how do you embrace this new technology and provide different opportunities? And this may look different for every different community. It's definitely going to look different, but it's kind of a catch-22 because if we want this, you need this. You need both, really, yeah. And this is also another one that's true of every age group because when we teach people different technology and we as librarians and educators, a lot of our main goals to expose people to this technology, provide resources and help them build their skills and connect them to other places in the community or online that they can achieve their goals and solve the individual problems that go to each individual aspect of their life. But what if we just give them the resource they click it open and they don't actually know what to do with it. And this goes to the, are we able to assess the technology skill level and the comfort level of the patron to be able to connect them with the right resource? And then how do we follow through and make sure that they use the resource, not either as intended or in a way that actually solved their problem? do they know where to go to navigate that resource? So if you want to teach people how to use new computer skills and you're going to use something like um, Goodwill Foundation or you use Digital Learn, or I put a whole slew of resources in that digital literacy guidebook just to teach basic skills and to connect people with different job skills and things like that. But how do we know they're getting, pulling the information they need and finding everything that they need? Good for that. So now, when we go online, how do we know that it's actually good for us? We question this for teens and parents are trying to control this for teens, but do adults have it under control? And I've heard different things from different communities that some adults are worried that they spend too much time online. And I definitely actually started to ask this question for myself. I started tracking the amount of time that I spend online. And then I asked myself, so what do I actually do online? Is it productive? Is it not, a, not everything in the world needs to be productive. Netflix is delightful. Oh, but it's escapism, it's entertainment, it's, yeah. But it's, 
so instead of asking, not am I being productive? Instead, I started asking, am I actually doing what I set out to do? And am I doing things in a way that doesn't stress me out? And am I, am I going down the internet rabbit hole is my main question. So, and as we know from the internet, people like to find out what other people's experiences are and kind of get a collective opinion about, okay, so does this work? What's worked for other people? What's stressing other people out? Um, is it okay that I'm stressed out about this? And the internet has kind of revealed that we're all giant balls of anxiety. Oh, but, yes. <laughs> yeah. It's not new, but, it's, but now we know. <laughs> so just even for teens or adults, having the shared board that says, this is a problem for me too. And this is what we can do about it. And in the example, I used a series of post-its, but that was just, it's a sample picture. It doesn't have to be post-its. It can be a whiteboard. It can be pretty much anything, but just some publicly shared thing, either online or in person that says, this is a problem or this isn't a problem. We can deal with this as a community. And so now we have this in place. We know what stresses people out, and this can be adults or teens. But now how can they use this information to shape their own future? And I say this is for teens, but it could also be for adults. But what are you doing online right now? And is it helping or hurting my future goals? And oddly enough, Netflix actually helps me because I, <laughs> if I work really, really hard or I'm really in like diving deep into learning something, my brain just needs a break sometimes. And if I don't take that break, I can't learn as effectively later. And that's science. Go to Barbara Oakley, she's delightful. <laughs> and so this is just a really good way to just make a list out of are my actual actions serving my goals and supporting my own values. So now to adults. And I'm going to check my time here. 1046. Okay. We're good. And um, I'll just mention too, um, we did start a little after because I was letting some people log in. So um, if we do go past our official 11 a.m. Central Time and you know, stop time, we won't just stop. <laughs> um, we'll finish up with whatever you have to share, Amanda. And if anybody does have any questions or comments or anything they want to ask, we'll we'll stay here as long as we, you know, people have questions. Um, if you do need to leave right at 11 a.m. because that's all the time you've allotted for this, that's fine. We are recording and you'll be able to watch the rest of the recording um, at your convenience later. So if you do have any questions or comments, you know, even um, go ahead and type them in the questions section at any time and I can grab them for Amanda too, just as a reminder. Do we have any that any pressing questions right now? We can take it. No, any it's not right now. No. <laughs> nope. All right. So for adults, and I know a lot of you mentioned this, that people were looking for building new job skills and looking at different ways that they can figure out a direction that they want to go. But so if we send people over to Goodwill Foundation or Google's, uh, the Grow with Google resources or Microsoft has resources to learn the skills themselves. But when people go out into the world and try to apply for jobs, they also need to be able to prove that they have these skills. So where do people go to practice? And that's one thing, that's one area that the library could actually help with is providing different ways to practice. So the biggest problem that people seem to have that I've heard about so far anyway, is business emails. So if you set up a service where people can take this online communication class and you can do it through Goodwill or through 
there's a bunch of resources. But being able to practice with a librarian or being able to practice with a, a volunteer or library staff member, but have that go back and forth. And then before the people have to practice it with their future employer, they've already worked out some more of the kinks. And that can also be a really valuable skill for library staff too, because honestly, everyone can work with improving their communication. And it's just a possibility. And there's a bunch of different job skills that people would love to be able to practice before just getting chucked into the deep end. But good times. And I talked about this a little bit with the teen section, but again, this definitely does apply to adults too. But just to reiterate, as people are learning these different job skills, building new hobbies or figuring out different ways to be, really kind of driving home that values. Because it, about a year or so ago, I started, actually it was longer than that. I think it's been about, has it been three years since I started the digital literacy stuff? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> might be <laughs> but I started asking myself in every piece of technology that I use is this actually serving me or am I serving technology mm. and I wound up I stopped using half of the stuff that I used before mm. because I went down so many internet rabbit holes and I wasted so much time and I just let people stress me out on different social media platforms. And it just, it was stressing me out more than helping me. So mm -hmm. I just started changing small habits and shifting and tweaking different things. And over the course of about maybe two years, I shifted the way I use technology. And I feel like I was a whole lot better off for it, but how can libraries help other people do that? And one thing is getting people to think about this. So what gets people hooked on technology? And this book, I actually went to a presentation recently by this author, and I guarantee I will not pronounce that correctly, but you can read it. <laughs> but he has two books out, um, Hooked and um, Indistractable. Indistractable is the more recent one, but he talks about values first technology. And he talks about, sure, companies can get people hooked. They know the neuroscience behind it. They know how the brain works. They know behavior patterns. And he shows people how that works. But then he says, but do you really, really, really want to hook people on a product just to get them hooked? And it's also part of the user's responsibility to understand how they're using this and how it's impacting them. So if you even just reading this as a book group discussion and mm -hmm. starting to think about that and even asking people in like a makerspace setting to start using the resources from this book to start designing these different products and materials and ask if it's actually serving people's values and start thinking about what's important to people and is this actually helping people solve a problem? And sometimes you just need to unplug. And so I recently joined an adult coloring, an adult book group coloring session and I was, I was incredibly intrigued by this concept because I really love a good adult coloring book. They're delightful. And I wasn't sure how it was going to work to just get together with a bunch of other adults with some coloring books in front of us. But we had some good conversations and it was, it was away from the computer. It was something that was just face to face interaction. If there was a lull in conversation with a bunch of new people, you just get to sharpen your coloring pencil and go to town. And I loved it. I don't know if the group here was the first one that did it, but 
kudos. And just talking about, and this is kind of the reflection of the slide before is talking about not just in book groups or book discussions, but let people write about it and let people write stories about how technology is impacting people and let people write about what's stressing them out and just get that out there. Um, there's a, an organization called Kaneko that's in Omaha mm -hmm. and I love that place. Yeah. But I'm part of a writing group there that's for healing words and it is awesome. But we get together and we, there's different writing prompts and one of them was actually about technology. And we talked about how technology is changing everything and how it's permeated through everything. And it was just getting the words out, knowing that other people are thinking about it in the same way and hearing how they thought about it and having that shape the my ideas or have my ideas shape them and getting together as a community and knowing that it's going to work out. <laughs> but it's a good group. And then, so basically you're just kind of not making technology so much of a focus. So the funny thing is that to teach digital literacy, sometimes you just don't techno touch technology at all. And for different communities, this will mean different things because some people maybe are not addicted to technology. Maybe that was just me, but who knows? <laughs> just in case, there's also a more structured way because some people are like, I really, really, really want to detox from technology. Or I want to unplug, but how? So this website will show you different activities that you can do and different ways that you can just kind of slowly pace yourself and distance from technology. And they have one for kids too. So you can sign up, take the pledge. You'll get a whole bunch of different resources in your email. And there's also an option for unplugging youth. And I still think the cell phone sleeping bag is just cute. <laughs> <It is. laughs> but you can actually do this one as a community. So if, you, if we scroll down here, there's a DIY resource kit. And a lot of these kits this kit, I've used a lot of these for adults too, because it's universal. But you can, as a library or educator, you can fill out this form. It'll ask you your contact info. And if you have a small group of people doing it, it'll ask you for the estimated number of participants and where you're from. And then you'll get kind of a resource pack and a whole bunch of information about setting up an unplugging event in your own community. All right, so back here. And our time is okay. No problem. About five minutes to 11. We're good to go. So now we are on to older adults. So Adults want to be entertained too. So this is kind of just a tongue in cheek option that I found online that is just, <laughs> I've heard a lot of older adults making fun of memes or having a grand old time with memes. It's a 50-50 split. So when you do a social media class, mm. add a meme section. There's a whole bunch of free yeah. meme generators and they can have some fun with it. And so this is one that a while ago I talked to my grandpa about, and he actually picked this meme out. <laughs> like this meme is probably maybe 15 years ago. My, like my grandpa has since passed since then, but the meme is timeless. Sure it is. Yeah. But he really liked going to different events that showed what's going on with new technology and to find out for to kind of decide for himself what was important. 
and what meshed with his own lifestyle. So it was through the library that he learned more about social media and he learned about, um, he didn't learn about video conferencing. It was mostly social media, but now it's more about video conferencing because Zoom is kind of taking over the world. Mm. But kind of finding out that you can connect with friends and family and be able to see them and kind of experience those moments in a more interactive way than just a phone call, it can be awesome. And so some older adults, they don't see themselves as older. And honestly, I don't see them as older either. I mean, they're still getting out. They're still, a lot of them are doing more after retirement than they were before they were retired. And it just embrace that. So hold photography sessions and whole and kind of show the, the newer side of technology. If you think that younger people would love it, older people probably would too. So put out that um, I have, I have no idea when I'm actually going to be able to put these out into the public because the tech kits have been kind of shut down for the time being for COVID-19, which is completely understandable. Mm -hmm. But eventually, let me go here. So this is a set of kits that I put together. And these are kind of a good tech exploration for people of all ages. And I found out that adults actually really like to play with snap circuits. They're delightful. <laughs> so eventually, once this is out into the world again, then it's a good option to be able to have kind of a little tech exploration. But more just the most important part is just putting people first and figuring out what matters to people, what matters in their lives right now, and how can we balance the whole technology thing. So if you have any questions, my email address is right there. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if anybody has any questions about anything that um, Amanda's talking about, our thoughts or ideas that you have of how you've done this in your library, please do share it. Um, we do have a few comments. Actually, uh, the link that you did provide for the Google Docs, it looks like it's not actually set for sharing yet. It's saying oh. you need to be logged in or have a password or be allowed. So I'm not sure if that's something you need to uh, still do. Um, behind the scenes somewhere or it was one button let's <laughs> try this one and if someone can tell me if that one lets you open it let's see yes it worked for me i double checked it first before i yeah and if any, so if you are in the state of Nebraska, there's also a digital literacy course that is available right now. And if you'd like to sign up for that, you can. Yes, I updated the session info so that it has in there to contact you. Oh, cool. I did that while we were doing this, yes. And do you have the link available to the session? Oh, yeah. Um, do, 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 do. And so the digital literacy class that I put together is about identifying your target audience, figuring out what matters to them, going through a slew of possible digital literacy options, and then figuring out what works for you and building kind of a digital literacy plan to tackle technology skills in your own community. So if you want to take that class and you are a Nebraska library staff member, then feel free to send me over an email and we'll get you set up. Yep. Yep. You'll notice if you do go to it, if you're in Nebraska library, that it there's you know, is as a typical in our um, training calendar, 
the registration button doesn't work and it says the class is closed. Uh, but there is an extra note that I just updated this morning that says its registration is still open. Just and there's a link there to email Amanda to actually join it in progress. So you didn't have to get into it before it actually started. It's still available. And don't worry, it's only about a day in. So yeah, it was initially just started on Monday, which actually for us was a holiday. So who knows? Yeah. yeah. And, <laughs> and hindsight would have started this year through July 19th. So you've got quite a bit of time to get everything you use know, plenty of time yeah so. and if you are but outside you're not nebraska this one you know our encompass live shows here we do on wednesdays are free and open to anyone this is a class that's specifically only for nebraska um library staff is different and if you are outside of nebraska the class relies heavily on this guidebook because that was open for anybody to use yeah yeah, yeah. And the major difference between just using the guidebook and just using the class and using the class with it is the class just does more sharing of ideas and conversation. But as we go through the idea sharing, I've also added an examples in the library section to a lot of these different areas. So there's kind of like a running list of different ways to use it. And let me see the last thing I was going to go in here. So we talked a lot about basic technology skills and getting people up to speed on using different devices. So this is a good section to kind of assess where your community is at or where individuals are at. And then different ways to learn more about how the device works, what the computer is, what it does, how the mouse works. And the funny thing is there is an online class to show how a mouse works, but you need to know how to use a mouse to access the website, which I've always been amazed by. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why you have a librarian standing next to you. <laughs> so once they're comfortable with the mouse and they're able to navigate everything, then they can start using those resources to build themselves up. And this, uh, that's also why I pointed out not just giving people the resource and hoping that they go to town, but sitting with them and making sure that they have the baseline skills to be able to succeed. And this one is to not everyone will come in and know exactly what they already know and what they need to know for technology. So that's why I put together some links for basic skills technology assessment. The North Star, which I just noticed has a typo in it. Oops, I'll fix that. But I will take off the T because it's North Star, not North Start, but it will get you started. And North Star is out of Minnesota and they have a lot of resources that you can embed into your own library and use in your own library. Mm -hmm. Nice. And so do we have any questions or do we have any ideas of what digital literacy has worked for you and your community? Um, doesn't look like anything has come in yet. Anybody have anything they want to share right now? It is a little almost 10 after well, 1107 by my uh, clock here. Any um, last minute desperate things that you want to ask of Amanda or anything you want to share? Um, that you are doing at your library. Well, I think this is great. I'm, I'm as I said, you know, digital literacy is hugely important, but it is boring, scary, too much to deal with for some people sometimes. So I think it's great to have all these tips and 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 you know tricks of how to do it. And the guidebook is great, definitely. I've been exploring that myself, the digital literacy guidebook that you've created. So I think that's a great resource for people to go and check out as well for more info. It doesn't look anybody's typing anything in desperately. So um, you've got Amanda's email address, I guess, then you can reach out to her later if you want to. Cool. Yeah, all right. Um, I am going to pull presenter control back to my screen. And 
So here is, yes, the link worked <laughs> to the slides. So you can use it from the link that you were shared, or it will also be available when the recording goes up later. So you'll have it available to you then. So I think that will wrap it up for today's show. Thank you, thank you, Amanda, for being with us this morning from home. Um, and as I said, uh, the beginning of this is pretty sweet tech is every Wednesday, every, the last Wednesday of every month. <laughs> and so the next one will be, Amanda will be back with us on June 24th, topic to be determined. So keep an eye on the schedule there. I'm sure Amanda has some ideas of what she might talk about. Um, yeah. added there uh, in the next month or so. And you see, this is our Encompass Live main website. And you can see our upcoming shows here for all of June are booked. I've got a couple of dates also confirmed for July. I'll get them onto this calendar as I get things finalized. I'll just show you here. This is where our archives are that I mentioned when the sh recording is ready for today's show, which should be by the end of the week. As long as YouTube and GoToWebinar cooperate with me, it'll be here. The most recent one at the top of the list here. This is last week's. So um, today's show will be here. We'll have a link to the recording, a link to the presentation. Her Google Slides will be both there available for you to look at. This is our full archives. I'll show you while you're here. We do have a search feature here. So you can search the entire archives or just the most recent 12 months, most recent year. This is because this is our full archives going back to the beginning of Encompass Live. Encompass Live premiered in January 2009. So we have over 10 years worth of recordings and archives here. So just pay attention when you are looking at our archives, the date of when something was originally broadcast. Some things will be fine and, and will stand the test of time. Some things, not so much. <laughs> uh, just pay attention. Some links might be broken. Services or products might be different than what was originally done. But just pay attention to our archive, the date of the original broadcast, or just limit your search to the most recent 12 months so you don't have to worry about that. Um, we do also have a Facebook page. You see I've got some links here going out to our Facebook page here. So if you do like to use Facebook to keep up on things, we do post reminders here. as a reminder to log in today's show. When our recordings are available, we post on here. So a few times a week you can get a notification about Encompass Live if you um, do like to use Facebook to keep up with things. Other than that, just let me double check. You have nothing else new coming in here. What do we have here? All right, um, I think that will wrap it up for today's show. Everything looks good here. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you being, for being here with me again, Amanda. We'll see you in a month. <laughs> um, and hopefully we'll see some of you another time on Angus Live. Oh, our next week's show is Automating Virtual Student Library Cards. I should bring that up here. Um, oh, cool. Something that um, virtual library cards, something that our libraries are trying to deal with themselves, I know, um, being... Uh, close to the usual way of getting library cards. So um, I know a lot of people are doing remote online, and this is a way that a school and a library got together and did it. So definitely please do sign up for our next week's show on that and any of our other topics that we do have coming up. And keep an eye on our schedule, our calendar here for our July and August and future dates coming up. So that's it for today's show. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Amanda. Hopefully we'll see you another time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye. Hi. <laughs>